um, I was reading in the hive and the honeybee and they brought up an interesting point they do that's one of the only sources I found that talks about honey house design and considerations for that they said don't put your honey house on the same tract of land that's got your primary residence because then you can't sell it well there's something to be said for that you know our previous honey house to this one was on the same property where we live and that that's absolutely correct if you're if you're looking at this from a businessman point of view that's a very good point yeah i have an asset here and actually have two pieces of property here we'll take a tour and you'll see that i have two pieces of property here and they're uh they're separate so i can sell them separate so i'm kind of thinking that way too that's a very good point yeah, let me tell you something I'm experiencing here. We've got a serious amount of money invested right here. And uh, the president of our the bank I deal with, it's a big United Community Bank. There's a lot of banks in this area, and he's president of the region. And he's a pretty smart man, and I ask his opinions on stuff. He said, one of the problems you have as you get bigger is that you narrow your buyer's field. Yep. Now, we've got a million-dollar piece of property here plus another half a million in the other piece of property. And we were I've been thinking about putting an addition on here, and but which would make it even more expensive, which in his advice is just be, be mindful that that's going to narrow the field of buyers the more expensive your property gets. So I'm looking for other property around me We've already purchased the one on that side of us. I don't know if I can get the one on that side of us, but uh, uh, trying to keep things broken into segments that can be sold separately. Yeah. yeah. You may not know this offhand, but I would really like to look at the math that you've got here, just in the building, how many square feet. And not only that, but how much of that is drum storage, bottle storage, woodenware, your drying room, your extracting room? Because I think we could probably extrapolate, you know, you've got a big building, mm -hmm. but if I build a smaller building, I know I need a minimum amount of space for extraction and this and that and the other, but it, it would be nice to just have some idea of how to allocate the... Yeah. Well, this building, the, the first floor is 14,800 square feet. And the second floor is uh, a little over half the building, so it must be 8,000 square feet upstairs. And then we've got that other building down there, which is several thousand square feet. And uh, <clears throat> I knew the day we built this building that it wasn't going to be big enough. Back to our earlier conversation it was all I could afford I couldn't do any better I, it needs to be probably 50 percent bigger than it is honestly wow. I'd say uh, probably of the 14,800 probably a third of it is drum storage and that's what's not big enough we can pack about 15 1800 drums in there but it's not enough I need more drum storage um, the processing rooms are limiting. Uh, we have two processing rooms, one for extracting, which is 40 by 30, and the honey pouring room, we call it, is a 50 by 30, and they're both too small. Um, so in that respect, I made a mistake, but I had no choice. I did what I could do. We've already pushed out a, 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 uh, an expansion on the other end of the building that is 16 by 82, and that was helpful. And one recommendation I have for people building a building is even if it's small, even if it's just a 40 by 40, build it high so you can put lean-tos off of it and make it a bigger building. If you start off with a 10 or a 12 foot ceiling, you can't go out very far because you're already too low. So that's one piece of advice. Another thing about the high ceiling is we were able to put in this second story. I guess you would call it a mezzanine up there, mm -hmm. and it's loaded. I mean, it's packed. So that's my, that's just storage. It is storage, but it's cheap square footage because yeah. it's already under the same roof. So if you, and and it has a drawback in that that we have to lift stuff up there. We choose to use a forklift. Originally, I thought I might put an elevator, but oddly enough, the forklift 
ended up being really the way to go. Um, that's 10, it's 11 feet is what it is up there and our forklift reaches up there and uh, it's built like a, it, we can park a semi up there, it's built extremely well. This floor above us right here is very solid and so that's inexpensive square footage. As we're adding on, this mezzanine is already over half the building but we just needed more square footage without having to build more buildings so we just increased the second story floor space. Uh, things that aren't super heavy, like uh, plastic containers, bee supplies, and pallets of quartz go up there, but the drums of honey always stay down here so we can stack them three high. That's a lot of weight sitting there in a stack of drums. Can't do that upstairs. Wouldn't want to anyway, because if a drum leaks or something, you don't want it on a wooden floor. It needs to be down here. Um, I don't know if the camera can see this. I'm looking at how this is built. You've got, what, two by 10s on 12 inch centers there? Well, they're, they're two by 12s <laughs> on 12 inch centers wow. and they're a high grade of two by 12. They're not just, you know, they're high grade two by 12s. Lots of steel in here holding this thing up. Yeah. You, we just put uh, 26 pallets of quartz in, in the space less than what we're looking at here and that's 38,000 pounds. It's just sitting in this little space right here. So this floor is really built well. We also have this beekeeping supply yeah. thing out here and that's starting to take up a fair amount of space. That's probably taking up probably 20% of our square footage now because we're selling so many bee supplies and then the retail store we got to keep that stocked, back stock out in the warehouse. So uh, if this was only a honey producing facility, the square footage we have here, 2300 drum level, would probably be pretty good. It's everything, it's all of the above that's stretching our facility. The retail store is uh, probably the fastest growing aspect of this business. I thought the retail would just be a minor addition to this whole thing and it's turned out to be major. Of course we're on a four-lane U.S. highway out here and uh, um, something that, I'll tell you what made the retail jump suddenly in one heartbeat was I uh, rented six billboards and put up big broad yellow with black print billboards very simple very little language real eye-catching about this facility you know Blue Ridge Honey Company six miles ahead and uh, it's expensive. I've got, you know, gosh, maybe, oh gosh, I've got $4,000 a month rent on those billboards. And I thought, how in the world will I ever know if they're paying off? And the next day, it was just so obvious. We were stunned. I was, I'd ask people coming in the door, uh, you know, how did you learn about us or what made you stop? And they said, well, you know, the billboard we saw back there. Our business went up eightfold in one day. Mm -hmm. And suddenly we were, you know, grossing a few hundred bucks or a good day might be 500 bucks in the retail store. Suddenly it was 5,000 and we're like, whoa. So advertisement works as long as it's done properly. I found that advertising in local magazines and things like that did not work. Those billboards is re what really worked for us. So <clears throat> ceilings and walls and, oh, yeah. and all that, what... Um... I mean, where, where do you have to find a contractor that is familiar with building restaurants to get this stuff, or, no. or what? No. Um, our inspector says no surface can be porous. Any wood has to be covered in enamel paint, not flat paint. You won't allow flat paint, and rightfully so. Uh, enamel is what you can wash. Every surface has to be washable, cleanable, not porous, and that's not hard to do. Um, you know, seal your cement and paint your wood. It's really as simple as that. Um, our walls are uh, plywood. I thought about going with polyethylene panels, and which is legit. You see those in dairies a lot, mm -hmm. and that's legit. But what, what you're going to see out here is we have uh, viewing windows into our processing rooms, and I wanted to paint the rooms and make them look nice, and they are. Two-tone paint job. They're very attractive. And uh, we used... Uh, ply, uh, just wood plywood and painted them really nice and put a good acrylic enamel uh, surface on them and I've not been unhappy with that at all. They don't take bumping and bashing, you know, like polyethylene panels would 
or poly, might be polypropylene. Anyway, you can you can find those. They're four by eight sheets or four mm. by ten sheets that you can put on the wall. And if you're not trying to be pretty and beautiful, that might be the proper <laughs> way to go. To move to drums, um, you're either going to have to have a Tommy lift on a truck or a loading dock, a, a barrel truck, hand barrel truck at minimum. Forklift would be better. Um, your concrete floors are going to have to be rated for the weight mm -hmm. of all this That's stuff. Right. Yeah. So a four inch slab may not do it. You no, may it does a, not do it. In a, if three drums high on a slab does not do it. Yeah. So how thick is your... Well, ours is five to six inches, depending on what part of the place you're in, and it's uh, 5,000 PSI concrete. It's very hard concrete. So uh, we, our concrete slab in this facility costs us more than the building. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah, we have a hard, I can still remember the number, it was $101,000 for the concrete slab for this one building. So food manufacturing facility, flooring and ceilings and walls. Mm -hmm. um, my regulations say I've got to have imper impermeable flooring with trapped drains. If it's concrete, it's got to be sealed. Mm -hmm. And the hive and the honeybee cautions against wax. You need to consider wax build up in your in your traps and your drains well it's farther than that and i'm glad you brought that up um and i'm gonna show you when we walk out in the warehouse i'm gonna show you a hundred foot stretch of concrete with a different color piece of concrete down you know where i'm going with yeah. this okay so i told you about wax and floor drains uh i didn't even think about it so one day we couldn't get water flowing through the drain we called Roto-Rooter, we called a commercial jetter company. We just couldn't break through. And you can see the fresh cement here. It goes under the wall into the next room. It goes under the wall back in there. It was just this one stretch. It comes from the extracting room to the comb room. And then it, it breaks off here and goes to the tank. And we had to tear this floor up and put a brand new four inch pipe right down through this section. And that was my lesson learned the hard way. So Dave is the one that keeps the pipes clean. We have our own smaller version of a jetter. And uh, once a month, he goes through all these pipes, including the ones that are under the sink. Because a lot of wax goes down the sink that you wouldn't think about, you know, cleaning a lid off or cleaning a bucket that has some scum on the lid. And uh, if you don't keep that maintained, eventually you're going to have problems. And again, like I said, hot water is the worst because it makes that wax soft and it all sticks together. So uh, that was a messy day when they had to tear up this whole floor. We had to get it done right now. We, I mean, we had to have our floor drains immediately. So luckily we got a contractor in here and he was able to do it almost immediately. And of course it cost a lot of money. If it's okay, I'd like to talk about septic systems a little because sure. people make a big mistakes there. I've made one. Had to learn it the hard way. Our system has 360 feet of leach line. Um, wouldn't mind having more, but that's how big it is. And then we have three tanks. One is the, where it catches all this garbage. And the next one is for solids. You know, all the toilets and stuff flow into that. The first one flows into it also. All the floor drains flow into the first tank, and then that tank and all of our toilets flow into the second tank, which would be, you know, a normal septic tank. And then beyond that, we have a, a fluids tank. Uh, many septic fields flow out of your main tank, and the fluids go into your leach field. Ours actually flows into a very large tank. It's like a, it's like a firewall in case the middle tank overflows. No solids of, of any kind yeah. can get into our leach field. We have a huge field, and uh, at the last honey house I had, um, our leach line completely plugged up, just went solid like a cork. I mean, wow. we had water coming up out of the ground out at the end of our leach field, and uh, couldn't figure that out. 
So we dug into it. We didn't remove it. We just tapped into it and put in more Leachfield line at the end of our existing line, and that worked great. And I was talking to the guy that put in our field. He's kind of a friend of mine, and I said, uh, he, uh, he said, I said, well, how did we do this? I mean, you know, what's the problem here? And he said, well, you uh, the worst uh, offense for septic fields is dead microbes. They clog, the, it just pastes the walls of everything and nothing can flow through it. And I thought about that and I said, Di dead microbes. Guess what kills microbes? Hmm. Honey. If you're flushing mass quantities of honey down your septic field, you're killing it. It's acidic. You're killing all the microbes in there. You can flush all the ridex you want down the drain, but you're just neutralizing it with mass quantities of honey. So we're actually very careful not, like if we have a spill, we try to clean it up and pick it up and not necessarily wash, you know, 55 gallons of honey down the floor drain. This property is very slightly uh, inclined, like it's 180 feet long, and this side where the retail is, is at grade, and that end is about four feet above grade, which was absolutely perfect because that's where our docks are. You need to be able to uh, back a semi-truck up there. Very important, and that was the huge step for me from my last honey house. Our last honey house, we couldn't get a semi in there. So this is a perfect example of the you know the grade of our property. It's ever so slightly, uh, the gradient is very slight, and it gives us the opportunity to have the upper end at grade for the retail entrance, and then uh, this end, which is about five feet lower, gives us a good spot to build a dock. Of course, you can hear by all the traffic, we have really good access to this major road. Even if you're out in the country, you need to make sure the roads are good enough for semis. You know, you're so far out in the boonies in Tennessee, you might have a bridge that says <laughs> limited 10 tons or something yeah. like that. So keep an eye out for that. That'll be important. Yeah. So it's really, really helpful to have a really good uh, adjustable dock plate. Um, you pull this chain and the thing flips up and then the, uh, it kind of flips out and settles down on the truck bed. Uh, I would say 95% of the freight that we receive in this location, Louie drives right out into the truck or on the truck bed and to take it off. If you have flat ground, you're stuck uh, with pallet jacks moving to the end of the truck and then the forklift lifting it off. It's, it's a, so much more efficient if you can just back a truck up to the dock and let the forklift go out onto the truck bed. I would say um, that was the biggest problem I had at my last honey house. We couldn't do that. I couldn't even get a semi truck up my driveway and I ended up having to rent a location about five miles away where we could receive semi trucks and unload and then we had to ferry it back and forth. You only need about five feet yeah. from one end to the other to pull this off. Uh, most truck beds are around, most semi trucks are up around 48 inches, somewhere in mm -hmm. that neighborhood. If you have this adjustable dock, it can compensate for different trailer heights. Yeah. Yeah. I can see the, the efficiency in that. Any, any time you touch something twice to do the same job. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a lot less efficient than if you can just hit it one time and get it to where it needs to go. size at all you need a washing machine and dryer because you're going to go through a lot of rags and things like that and these are the little things that you don't think of at first and then eventually you go you know what we got we need a washing machine in this place <laughs> so. uh, even little things are that you never would think of like uh, do I have ample water do I have ample electricity and my recommendation is Whatever you think, whatever size electric panel you think you need to put in, just double it. Just double it. You think you need a one-inch water line? No, just double it. You know that's what you need to think about for the future. We've got an inch and a half line coming into this building, but it services uh, nine different 
water station sinks and hoses and all yeah. that. So, uh, you know, it'll break down from inch and a half into one inch, and then some of the ones that are the farthest away will be half inch or three quarter. And uh, I guess we're on the subject of water. I'll stick with it. All of our sinks have three quarter inch faucets. I mean, you can fill a five gallon bucket up in what well, probably 15, 10 or 15 seconds at any one of our sinks. You always got to think big, big and fast. So that's my water well tank over there in the corner. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something to really be considered if you're going to build a big commercial site. You've got to have a lot of good water. At my last honey house, we had really high quality water, but we didn't have a really good flow. The well was only a gallon, a gallon and a half a minute, which was fine for our house there. But yeah. when we started washing drums and all that kind of stuff, we'd run out of water. This well is 12 gallons per minute and it keeps up with everything we do here so I don't know what the magic number is but uh, this 12 gallons a minute is keeping up really really well. You need good water and lots of it. <laughs> All right remember I mentioned electricity mm -hmm. we've got 400 amps coming into this building if it wasn't for the natural gas we would never get away with 400 amps in this building. Mm -hmm. If this was an electrical building we'd have to have a thousand amps coming in here at least probably. What did you have in your last honey house? It was just uh, 200 amps, and, did, did and we broke okay? the main. We popped the main breaker more times than I can count with 200 amps. So you needed 400 then. I needed 400 then, and I really should have 600 now. We have to be very careful how we wire these boxes. We have to keep them well balanced so that one box isn't carrying the majority of the circuits. Um, we got had to think about okay, what's going to be on at what time of day and uh, try to keep everything balanced so we didn't overload the circuits. Uh, thank goodness I have natural gas here. Everything in the building that has to do with warming honey or even warming the place is done with hot water through, and you'll see we have six individual industrial on-demand hot water heaters in the facility and natural gas was such a blessing because it's so much less expensive. If I had to do all that with electricity, my electricity bill would be hard to swallow. It's already a bit much. So this is 199,999 BTU hot water heater. This is uh, exactly what you'd expect to see in the back room of a motel or something like that. Uh, laundromat, places like that use these big hot water heaters. And this is what we use to heat the floor. This one heats the floor in the barrel blending warming room. We got a circulating pump that circulates the hot water into the floor. And then we have a thermostat in that room that turns the hot water heater on and off. I'd say the hot water heater probably runs two thirds of the time. I hear it going on and off. It doesn't run constantly. And of course we have the flow gauge so we can see that the water is not indeed flowing. And then we have these temperature gauges of water in, water out. There's usually about a 20 degree difference. It'll leave here at about 180 and come back at about 160. Do you have radiant under the whole building? No, just in that warming room for the drums and I'll show you that room. Um, it could have worked throughout the whole building, uh, but boy that would have been an expensive thing to do. That Just doing that little 30 by 10 foot room was a, it was expensive.
We don't heat the warehouse. Once we go past the, the retail and the offices and the processing rooms where the drums are stored and jars and all that is not heated, I don't see a need to uh, temperature control that portion of the building. It would mm -hmm. be helpful, but it would be so expensive that I think, I'm, I think the, uh, the returns on the investment of keeping that heated and cooled would be less than the benefit. Well, so, I, obviously, for people that may not know, the ramifications of not having heated storage in a hot location is you need to watch your high temperatures in the summer, yeah, and then low temperatures in the winter don't really matter because you're going to be able to warm the honey any that's even right, if it does yeah. granulate. Um, well, you you hit on something that's very important. If we're not in bad shape here with our summer temperatures. We have a lot of humidity. Yeah. But uh, you're, it up, you're up get, in the mountains, yeah. though, so you don't get the. It doesn't get into the 90s a lot. I think we bear. I don't think we hit 95 this summer. We had a lot of low 90s, but that's not too bad. When I purchase honey out of Florida, I get it out of there just as fast as I can. A yeah. lot of those guys are storing those drums <clears throat> in a warehouse that gets 120 or 30 degrees, and that's very uh, has a, a huge degrading effect on honey. So when I'm purchasing out of Florida, I get it out of there as fast as I can, especially honeys like orange blossom, which change so quickly uh, with heat. Some honeys are not affected as quickly with heat as some. And orange blossom, and one of our local honeys here, sourwood, is really sensitive to heat. Hmm. And when I, ha I buy a lot of honey from up north, too, in Wisconsin and Michigan, South Dakota, North Dakota, and I'll even purchase honey up there and feel comfortable. If I feel comfortable with the man I'm dealing with, I'm happy to leave it there for the winter because it's in better shape up there than it is down here. So yeah. temperature is important, especially if you're trying to uh, produce high quality honey. Temperature, high temperatures is really your worst enemy. You have to watch the weather patterns of the areas you're purchasing honey from. Uh, for example, in South Georgia, uh, they get a lot of rain some years down there. And if it's a real wet, rainy, humid season while they're producing gallberry honey, I know to be on the lookout for thin honey. Those, those boys are going to have a hard time keeping their moisture right. Um, if you're purchasing honey in, in a situation where it's very arid, you know that honey's going to come into you real dry. So you've got to watch all these little things when you're purchasing honey. This is normally what we would call our comb room, which to us means the room that we bring our surplus honey supers in and dry the crop out before we extract it, which is through mm -hmm. that next door. We just came in through that door. You can see the size of the door. You can drive a forklift through there if you had to. We bring our supers in with a pallet jack. Yeah, keep door shut. We want that low humidity in here to remain. And uh, you, you mentioned pet peeve. If that door's left open, I can get on people's case because we, we go to great, uh, great extent to keep our humidity down to dry honey out. I do not want the atmosphere out there mixing with the atmosphere in here. So anyway, this is a 30 by 40 room, not that big, but if you really stuffed it, we could get 2,000 supers in here. Hmm. And they don't stay long. Uh, we have a big commercial dehumidifier over in the corner that we normally have here in the summer. That's just a smaller one now to maintain the humidity in here in the winter. And uh, that thing runs wide open. Once we start extracting and bringing the crop in, we turn it on and never shut it off. And we pull the humidity in this room way down, way, I don't even know, the gauges don't register sometimes, they only go down to 25. Uh, so, uh, and then we bring the temp, make sure the temperature's up between 85 and 90. And we turn all these fans, you see, these are just Home Depot construction site fans. Mm -hmm. 
put them on the ceiling and have them aimed down on high into the supers and we can pull a pretty interesting amount of moisture out of our honey supers in just two or three days. We try to have them through here within four days because on day four, if any of that has pollen in it or has had brood reared in it or anything like that, you can begin to have a hive beetle issue. And uh, it, it's okay because three days do, it works. We try to actually uh, bring our crop in before it's completely capped over because it's the uncapped portion that's getting um, the most uh, change. And for instance, the on cap might drop down to 13, whereas the cap is 18. And when we run it through the extracting room, it all blends together and we come up with something that's 16.9 or 17.5 or whatever. And uh, so we do just what the books tell you not to do. They say, get your crop mostly capped before you pull it. We like to pull it before it's completely capped so we can really have a strong effect on that on cap portion. Then we, now it's just a collection room of everything. Uh, it's turned into a storage room. We're making soap and making candles and storing wax. And it smells wonderful in here. It must be the essential oils or it's something. The, it's, yeah, it's all that those canisters yeah. for the soap right there. So I've got to say that I totally copied your idea on drying honey. Okay. And I read your article in Bee Culture on honey, which is one of the best that I've. It's the most helpful article I've ever read on honey. It needs to be in one of the books. It really does. Um, and I totally copied this. So I'm extracting in a 20 foot shipping container <laughs> that I spray foam insulated. Yeah, that's... I've got a whole house dehumidifier uh -huh. in a few hundred square feet. And in the summer, you know, I'm, I've got a portable air conditioner in there so I can keep it down to 95 degrees. <laughs> yeah. And I'm putting box fans on top of my supers. I extracted when I pulled honey, I had some of it that was 20 and a half percent mm -hmm. and I brought it down to 15 and a half in three days. Yeah. That box fan sitting right on the stack yeah. really works. I, I actually tried the cross stacking and blowing uh -huh. air at them, but then I column stacked and set a fan on top and had stickers underneath the, yeah. the stacks and uh, it, it moved a lot more air through. Was your it, crop uh, somewhat on capped? A little bit on yeah. capped or whatever? Yeah, quite a bit. What was the humidity in that space? Uh, as, as low as it would go. Hard I mean, it, it, stayed, yeah. it stayed at 30% and uh, water was just pouring out. And yeah. it was 85% humidity outside. Yeah, it works, yeah. It, uh, I, and I was puzzled, just amazed. You know, that's one of the things that is not hard to affect is the moisture. Yeah. And high. If you live in California or Arizona, it's a non-issue. They don't know what we're talking about. You go down into South Georgia and parts of Tennessee when you wake up every single morning and it's 90 or 100 percent humidity outside, you know, you pull your crop off in that humid environment, truck it home on a truck, you know, on cap it, extract it if you're not in a dry environment and you're doing just the opposite. You might have added a percent to it. Mm -hmm. So we're big on moisture here. I really, And not only that, it's not just about making it stable. I think it's a higher quality product. I think the honey it has more character. Uh, the customers are constantly, when we offer them the thicker stuff that's ours, ours is always thicker than anything we buy, they're always like, this is so much better. They like that thick. I think, I think it's more intense. That's a good that, word, I think intense. that's what yeah. it is. It's more intense. Yeah, all the characteristics yeah. are more defined, yeah.